Hello, my name is Nick Hare. I'm known as Hipster Brown on Twitter and other social platforms, uh, and I'm here to talk about Offline First IoT. To kick it off, uh, a bit about me. I work currently as a staff software engineer on the front-end platform team at a company called Betterment here in New York City. I am a enthusiast when it comes to embedding JavaScript on hardware, uh, as you'll learn a bit more about during this talk. And I've occasionally contributed to open source projects, both around hardware and not, um, and have also occasionally helped maintain some projects like that over the years. And finally, when I'm not tinkering on these types of uh, home projects, I'm usually found climbing indoors uh, or cycling outdoors, although this time of the year, it's usually the former. And so let's start with a story um, about something that happened back in the summer of 2019. I had recently moved to a new apartment with my wife. As we started to settle into our home, we discovered a slightly annoying experience with the lighting situation in one of our rooms. So as you can see here, the diagram of uh, the bedroom. And as you enter the bedroom, there's light switch over here, but they don't control any of the lamps that are found over in this space, um, or even some that we could have put over here. This meant at night, especially crossing a dark room to fumble around and turn on any of these sources of light. Um, and after many stub toes, uh, I thought about how I could solve this inconvenience. And so the first thought was, what about kind of dipping my toes into uh, the smart home space? And I'd heard about it over the years, didn't have necessarily a reason or motivation to do so in the past, um, but now seems like a good time. Um, and one thing that I didn't want to get into just yet because it seemed like a larger investment was kind of smart bulbs. And part of it was seeing diagrams like this, where it seemed way overcomplicated to need to speak to a device in my home after going through all of this, like having the bridge and having the, the light and having all this sort of setup, even though I'm not setting it up and it's done by someone else, it's just seemed like a little silly um, just to turn on a light. So I went with the kind of gateway device for a lot of people, um, the smart plug. It doesn't usually require a hub to set up in your home um, or batteries because it's plugged into the wall. And key for me, at least, was the ability to work with Apple HomeKit because my wife and I both have Apple devices and that seemed like the easiest thing to get set up with for us. And pretty was. It was it was a zero fuss experience um, for the most part and ended up working pretty well. But it wasn't done yet. So I could control the lamps with uh, my phone or my watch or computer. Um, but I still needed to have one of those devices on me at all times in order to do so. And that's not normally the, the behavior of you know, uh, how I use my devices at home. Like I tend to try to set them down or not have them on all the time. And so I needed something else to help out with this. And I wanted to think about like, what else could help me do this without having to rely on having, you know, something on me at all times. And so I remembered these old commercials uh, about the clapper as seen on TV. And I thought, that's kind of convenient to be able to kind of clap on, clap off. Um, but I didn't want to go buy that device because it's bulkier. Um, it wouldn't integrate with HomeKit, which is still convenient for its own reasons outside of when I actually need to turn it on um, when I'm not near the bedroom. And I looked at my shelf of development boards and wondered, what could I do and assemble myself to solve this problem? So I reached for my Tesla 2. And for those that aren't familiar with the Tesla project or uh, the Tesla 2 development board, um, it is a project to help make embedded hardware development available to the JavaScript community as a completely open source uh, device and tool set. And so the 
main platform for this was the TESOL 2. Uh, this device could run Node.js natively and communicate with hardware modules and sensors through the built-in JavaScript APIs, as well as take advantage of packages from NPM and uh, help run like any other sort of node server that you could expect. Uh, and one of the other best parts about Tessel was the ability to plug and play hardware um, and including modules for common sensors and peripherals like ambient light and sound. And so having these two pieces of hardware available, I started to prototype a naive clapper program um, using the ambient light and sound module. And so I won't go over line by line, but the basics of this means uh, creating a trigger level here that was fairly low, but not easily triggered, um, and setting that as like the threshold meant that I could listen for two quick events uh, within a second of each other in order to simulate a clap, or at least kind of guess that that was a clapping sound. And so this worked fairly well. I was pretty happy with it. Good enough for me. But there was still the issue of now informing HomeKit of this. So there wasn't like a native API that I could hook into as a JavaScript developer um, until I found HomeBridge. And so HomeBridge is a open source Node.js project for integrating smart devices that don't natively support HomeKit. Um, and it can be hosted on various platforms, including Raspberry Pi, which I also happen to have lying around on that shelf of development boards um, from some sort of previous event. And this was used to create my own hub um, or bridge device connected to HomeKit so I could create custom configurations for myself. And so using the plugin template and documentation, um, I was able to build a switch um, that could represent my Tessel. And so the basics for this is a JavaScript class. And this includes some configuration coming in as it's initialized by HomeBridge, including like this logger and some other settings that I wanted to allow through the HomeKit conf HomeBridge configuration. Uh, and so I defaulted to calling it my clapper. You could set a serial number. And I basically had it emulate a uh, Tessel integration and created a switch service. And with this service, you can control the on characteristic, uh, which just means it's a switch, it's on or off. Those are the, the two states for this type of service. And so I created that plugin and set it up on HomeBridge, but there's still this missing piece because, you know, how are they going to talk to each other? This thing living on a Raspberry Pi and this thing living on a Tessel, you know, they're in the same space. They're on the same Wi-Fi network. How would I enable them to talk to each other? And so I had a, a couple options I thought of. So there's the option of the plugin itself on the Raspberry Pi pulling, you know, a server on the Tessel and constantly asking for, are you on, are you off, are you on, are you off? Like, just looking for feedback at all times. Um, I could also do the opposite where the Tessel just makes a post request to a you know small server running through the plugin um, on the Raspberry Pi. There's also kind of web sockets that could be set up where um, there's the server on the Tessel that the uh, plugin could subscribe to for web socket information and share a connection. Um, and I could also just use a remote service uh, like Azure IoT Hub or Adafruit IO. But when I thought about each of these options, they had some downsides that didn't really meet my requirements um, for what I wanted to get done. And so uh, efficiency uh, is important for something like this for me um, because it would be on all the time and it's running on fairly resource constrained uh, devices, even if they are running, you know, tiny embedded Linux. Um, and 
I also wanted to be resilient. I didn't have to be like messing around with this all the time. I really wanted plug and play. I really wanted to be able to deploy something and have it just live, um, as well as be able to work on the parts independently without having to rely on some sort of shared configuration necessarily. And finally, kind of along the lines of resiliency was making it available offline. I really didn't want to need some external service or to rely on the internet always being up in order for this uh, service to work, this um, experience to work. And it, again, like I showed the diagram before with the light bulb, it seemed kind of silly to have to do this big round trip to a remote server in order to have these two devices in one space talk to each other. And so as I'm looking around and looking around and searching for options, I learn about this thing called IP multicast. And um, this allows for a sender to, you know, publish out an event or small packets of data and have multiple receivers. Um, and this was implemented over UDP, uh, the user datagram protocol. And this is the connectionless uh, cousin to uh, TCP, which is the underlying protocol for HTTP, as we're familiar with being web developers. And all this is to say that I had a way to send messages over Wi-Fi without worrying about, you know, connecting to specific clients or having specific clients know about, you know, this device or the sender. And so Node has had a module called the DGRAM module available to it for quite a while. Um, and this is for working with UDP sockets and, and multicast memberships and even though the API is a little verbose, it could work. And I had two platforms that could run Node, which meant I could have nearly identical code um, shared between them. And so knowing this, I wanted to make the usage um, a little bit nicer. So I created a small abstraction using the event emitter class around this sort of pub sub messaging over multicast. This allowed me and anyone else who wanted to use this to program devices across a network without worrying about the underlying kind of like pipeline um, or technology. They just used events like you're they're used to. So deployed it to production, stuck this to the back of a dresser, had this thing working um, pretty well um, and pretty dependably, and they could operate independently. I could take the Tesla off line when I needed to, I could uh, update the Raspberry Pi as needed without worrying about the two of them getting confused or failing over because all they did was either push messages out into the air or listen for messages out in the air that seemed to match this um, event called clap. And that also meant I could add more stuff into the integration that wanted to listen for clap events or other events without worrying about um, how it's going to keep all this stuff in sync. And so this was my first instance of creating an offline first IoT device within my home. And so I mentioned offline first IoT in the beginning because that's the title of the talk. Uh, but what is offline first? And so let's break down this term. I had originally learned about offline first back in 2013. The philosophy that discusses technologies and patterns for thinking about connectivity as progressive enhancement for web applications, allowing a productive experience while either underground or away from reliable internet access, and then allowing you to sync changes once you're online again. And making sure it's not communicated as an error, it's part of the experience. Um, and we can see this available through APIs like Service Worker, IndexedDB, and kind of modern web applications today. So how can we apply this to the state of smart devices and the Internet of Things? If you ever followed this account on Twitter, you've seen stuff like this, where a cat feeder has a service outage. And so that means the pet can't be fed or you have to break open the device in order to get the food out, um, which isn't a great experience. And 
you know, what if your car was offline or was not accessible through the things you're normally used to using it through um, because of a feature update that, you know, wasn't aware to you and, and how do you get around that? Uh, and outside of the convenience and reliability factor, there's still the security part of bringing devices into our homes that can, you know, listen or um, emit events or, you know, run code. And, you know, when the default attitude and path of least resistance to connecting is connecting to remote and possibly insecure servers, this creates many potential entry points for bad actors uh, to cause havoc or harm. And so I really wanted to, uh, to push forward with this idea of offline first, local, um, and preventing from these situations and being able to have a more reliable experience for people making something into their home. So what are other examples of offline first IoT? Um, as much as I would like to take credit for this idea, uh, the original concept was inspired by Sarah Grant's Subnodes project, which I saw at a Brooklyn JS meetup back in 2014. Um, that's a full year before I met the Tesla maintainers uh, and started building stuff with Tesla, and five years before this Clapper project I shared before. Uh, and then there's ideas around what if you didn't need Wi-Fi necessarily? Um, what if you could use sound to emit data for other things to listen to or emit back and respond? Um, so there's this protocol called Chirp that was working on this. Uh, and the first implementation was audible. Um, so you could hear the little chirps between different devices. And there were plans to create an ultrasonic version. So if you didn't want the sound, you could still have this sort of communication um, without necessarily knowing about it and still not relying on a central like Wi-Fi network. Uh, I'm not sure what the state of this project is today since it was acquired by Sonos last year. Um, but it's nice to see some of these available protocols coming through for people who want to tinker and experiment. But what about working with real products today? And so this is where something like Home Assistant comes in. I mentioned Home Bridge before, and Home Assistant is for folks who aren't part of the, um, or only have HomeKit or Apple devices and want to be able to still integrate their home. And this line in their call to action was what helped convince me this is worth investing in. Um, puts local control and privacy first. This is what I'm asking for with offline first IoT as well. Um, you can choose what and when information can be accessed by devices in your home or some sort of central space. Um, you can choose who gets to talk to the outside internet um, and what they get to bring back in. And one of the platforms around um, Home Assistant is called ESP Home, and this is based uh, on the Espressif ESP8266 and ESP32 systems on a chip. Um, and so these are low-cost chips that are enabling more and more off-the-shelf and low-power devices with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth capabilities. Uh, ESP Home also takes advantage of MQTT as a queuing to pub sub sort of system um, for local broadcasting and subscribing to events in your home. And um, they didn't, they don't necessarily use the multicast um, system that I was talking about before, and mostly because MQT is a bit more reliable. Um, so all of this being said, where does JavaScript come in? It's been a while since I mentioned that, uh, and this is a JavaScript conference. So what is the stuff I was talking about before, how does that matter? And so this is where um, I like to talk about companies like Modable, uh, which make a super small embedded spec compliant JavaScript engine called XS um, that can run on these expressive chips um, and a few other resource constrained uh, controllers and dev boards. 
uh, the core platform includes networking APIs for starting web servers and sending requests and enabling, you know, UDP and MQTT, um, along with all the other normal like sensors and, and other hardware controls that you would want for this type of uh, integration. And they're not the only game in town either. So there's JerryScript, which was originally created by Samsung um, and used by the Pebble smartwatch in order to embed JavaScript watch apps into something you wear on your wrist. Um, this was a lot of fun to work with, you know, years and years ago. Um, there's also Esprino, which was kind of the first take on embedding JS on these uh, ESP devices, along with their own custom boards that they've created. Um, and I don't want to knock these projects because they've been out in the open for much longer. Um, and the one caveat for a lot of them is that they have so they provide a subset of the language, um, whereas Modable has nearly everything you'd expect and want from JavaScript available on these small devices. Um, and it's an incredible opportunity. And part of the opportunity is with a standard for embedding JavaScript on all of these systems. Um, so the team at Modable is part of uh, TC53, which is a technical committee for standardizing JavaScript APIs on embedded systems. Um, since their forming a couple years ago, they've now published ECMA 419 as the first spec for embedded systems APIs for JavaScript. This is incredible. And in a short amount of time um, since creating, we now have something to work against for providing a, the same set of APIs across all these different systems. It really goes to show Atwood's law at work. Um, you know, any application that can be written in JavaScript will eventually be written in JavaScript, um, including on these tiny, low-powered wireless devices that can be anywhere. And so where does that leave us today? Um, so this spec is just starting to be implemented by the Modable team. Um, and, you know, having a spec to work against is great because now more platforms can be created to support it. Um, hopefully we can see something from Esprino or JerryScript or anyone else who works within those, those ecosystems to support it. Um, it would be just like sharing code across your browsers if you can share code across all these wider range um, of devices and hardware. And so things that I'm interested in exploring as I continue um, down this path is using the extensible APIs to experiment with multicast and UDP on the ESP chips. Um, I want to implement the ESP Home API service for integrating with um, Home Assistant or anything else that can work with it. And then what I'd really like to see is a streamlined setup experience. So JavaScript developers are so used to doing things like create React app or being able to scaffold up something very quickly or have access to all these modules through uh, a single command line. Um, and that's not the case yet for you know, Modable. And I'd really like to see that mature over the years and help contribute towards that. Um, because that's something we focused on a lot at Tessel and I want to see happen with this brand new community that's coming up. Um, and I'd like for you to share your ideas with me. Um, I appreciate your time. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter or read about some of my musings as I continue to explore this um, on my website and have a great day.